effectiveness in what you're doing. Excellent. So according to Dr. Albert Bandura, who is the most noted researcher in the study of self-efficacy, he defines it as the belief in one's ability to succeed in a specific situation. So before we go any further, I do want to introduce you to Dr. Van Doren. And the reason I want to do that is I'm going to use a lot of his work on the slides. So Dr. Albert Van Doren began his work back in the late 1960s. Now there's two things to note about the late 60s besides the hippie era. One, television was now a household item. And two, there was a new toy of the 60s known as a Bobo doll. Today it's known as a Bozo Bot bag. It looks like this, only it's a lot bigger. You guys know what I'm talking about? All right, so Dr. Van Dora is given credit for being the first person to go to the television industry and say the words. If you put violence on TV, it will influence aggressive behavior in society. He did not win a lot of friends with the television industry. But to prove his point to America, he took the new toy of the 60s and he placed it down in a nursery school playroom. Well, the children didn't know what the clown did, so the clown was smiling, so the children smiled. One little girl actually put her arm around the bobo doll and swayed back and forth. Another little boy actually tried to hold a conversation with the bobo doll. But not one child balked the bobo doll. He then exposed all the children to commercials of well-dressed adults coming in, smiling at the camera, boxing the bobo doll, smiling at the camera along the way. And the adults got creative as well. One lady came in in a professional outfit. She smiled at the camera. She took a rubber mallet out of the pocketbook. She beat the bobo doll over and over again. She put the rubber mallet back in the pocketbook, smiled at the camera, and walked away. Over time, every single child, 100% of the children, at some point in their playtime, would box that bobo doll. And they got to eat as well. One little girl actually hit it with her doll baby. Another little boy actually held the bobo doll down and beat it over and over and over again. The point he was trying to make is this. We, all of us, we are influenced by the relationships and environment around us. We are influenced toward aggressive behavior, but we're also influenced towards positive, good, and productive behavior as well. In the 1980s, 1990s, Dr. Albert Bandura went on to do some long-term longitudinal studies to find out how do we support people to believe in their own abilities to succeed. And he found that there were three most effective ways, which we're going to go over in this workshop. But before we do that, we do want to get you all involved. So I know this is a quieter group. I heard it from the good morning. So I'd like everyone to put your arms above your head and go, ah! ah! Okay, I do know you have voices, so I'm going to turn it over to Scott. Okay, uh, so our question here is, what gets in the way of people believing in their own abilities to No. So my question here is, what gets in the way of people using their own abilities to succeed? Not liking yourself so you don't feel like you can 
Yeah, how you actually uh, feel about yourself, uh, your own self-esteem. And if your esteem is low, then you probably have less to him to definitely got worth and value when you do things. Okay. All right. So, uh, people with a strong sense of self-efficacy, and this is some of the advantages of having self-efficacy. This is why, as you're working with people, what you're thinking about equal to self-efficacy. Why it's important for individuals um, to have a level of a belief in their own abilities to succeed. People who believe in their own abilities to succeed view challenges as tasks to be mastered rather than tasks to be avoided. They develop a deeper interest in activities they choose. So if someone says, um, hey, I think I have a goal, I have a particular pursuit that I would like to go after, I'm not sure I can succeed with it. But if they have self, a sense of self-efficacy, they will develop more of an interest and they'll develop more of a stick-to-itness to follow through on it. They have stronger commitment to succeed and they're more resilient. People kind of know what resilience is. You can knock down and it's not working for you, for you so well. You're able to get back up. So that self-efficacy allows you to have increased resilience so, here's part of the question. How do we actually support people who believe in their own abilities to succeed or some techniques or approaches that can uh, support people to believe in themselves? So, it actually starts with your own belief system. Do you truly believe that the person you are with can learn, grow, and move forward in life? And we actually have research to prove it. We have a group of neuroscientists that are studying the phenomena of belief. What happens when you truly believe in something or someone? And this is what they're finding in layman's terms. They're finding that our brain and our heart are connected. Wow, took scientists to figure out that a whole being, no figure. But what they're finding is that each of us have an electromagnetic field or an energy field around our heart. You can actually measure the energy of the heart. You go to the doctor and you get a what? Yeah, an electrocardiogram. So you know your heart has energy. And what they're discovering is when you have strong, self-perceived positive thoughts that are in line with strong, self-perceived positive emotions which creates a belief, and a belief that's sometimes so strong you can feel the passion and energy in your body. I believe so strongly that all people can learn, grow, and go in this amazing journey we call recovery. That when I even speak about it, passion is building up inside me. I can feel it. When that happens, the electromagnetic field or the energy field around my heart it actually vibrates outwardly to connect with other energies in the room. So the point is this. The Beach Boys have it going on. You can actually send good, good, good vibrations out to other people. Beliefs are truly contagious. Are yours worth catching? So let's say that's Dr. Albert Van Dora, by the way. Let's say you're also a believer. You believe that people can learn and grow and move forward in life. What's the next step? The next step is to communicate your belief in a way that each person comes to see their own worth and potential. And for Dr. Albert Bindor's research, he found that there were three most effective ways to support to support another person to believe in themselves. In reverse order, they are social persuasion, social modeling, and mastery experience. He also found out some other fun facts in his research. I'd just like to go over one of them right now. He found that when people were faced with what they perceived was a really difficult challenge, their bodies would respond. Butterflies in the stomach, shaky knees, heart palpitations. And it wasn't so much the body was responding to the challenge, it was how a person. 
So the first approach is social persuasion. This is seen as the third most effective way to support a person who believes in their own abilities to succeed. Social persuasion basically says this. People can be convinced to believe in their own abilities. But social persuasion is more than Pollyanna optimism. How many people here know what Pollyanna optimism is? Would anyone like to explain in your playground voice what Pollyanna optimism is? Ah, uh, yeah, it's those disingenuous affirmations that make you feel good to say it, but does nothing to legitimately support a person to move forward in life. Oh, Scott, I believe you can do it. It makes me feel good to say it. But there's nothing to legitimately walk with Scott forward. Social persuasion is a three-step process. That goes affirmation, evidence, right opportunity. So go ahead and give Scott that positive affirmation. Hey Scott, you've been saying you want to get a job. I believe you can do it. Follow that with what you have witnessed are Scott's strengths. The reason I believe you can get a job is every time the two of us are to meet, you show up on time ready to communicate. And did you know communication skills is the third most important thing employers are looking for in a new hire? Timeliness is second. Follow that by an opportunity to walk with Scott on this journey. I believe so strongly that you can get a job that I want to take part of the journey with you. So what is the first step we can take together? That's social persuasion. Affirmation, evidence, right opportunity. Here's another cool thing about Dr. Arbor Van Dorf. All the way back in the 1990s, he said, we must be very, very intentional in the language we use. And he said this, and I know it's going to bring up controversy, but he said, it is not about changing a word you don't like to a word that sounds better. That's not what intentional language is all about. It's not about saying, oh, Gina is so manipulative. Oops, I'm not supposed to use that word. What's a better word for manipulative? That's right, Gina is resourceful. That is not what intentional language is all about. Intentional language says, get in touch with your own belief system. Believe that the person you are with can truly succeed and then use language to reflect your new belief system. Intentional language supports a person to unleash the power within him or herself. Offers choices and options, not final answers. Expresses curiosity. Seeks to understand the person from the person's point of view. Opens the door to new possibilities, but doesn't dictate a person's path. Presents right opportunities, and this one is tricky. You want to present an opportunity as if you are offering someone a diet soda. If they're thirsty, they will say yes. If they're not thirsty, they will say no. But your attitude does not change whether they take advantage of the opportunity or not. And intentional language is based on what's happening in a person's life, not what's inherently wrong with a person. So that's social persuasion. I'm going to turn it over to my husband, who's going to go over the next one.
modeling is a kind of psychological term for well, basically it's a pretty um, pretty simple concept here, which most people can relate to very easily, particularly uh, if you've had experience working with uh, things like uh, uh, supporting people directly. Um, social modeling is seeing people similar to oneself succeed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Seeing people similar to oneself succeed by sustained effort raises the observer's belief that they too possess the capabilities to master comparable activities and succeed. So Dr. Dan Flora there is saying, um, but social modeling basically says when you see a person who you perceive as similar to you, uh, they may uh, dress like you, they may look like you, they may have had similar backgrounds or life experiences, educational experiences, come from the same parts of town, uh, when you perceive them as similar to yourself, and when you see them reaching a goal that you want to achieve, you say, hey, if Gene can do it, I can do it too. So, social modeling is really just a way of um, kind of something that we call a lot of very
So those are some of the, uh, the ways that uh, peer support is uh, an example of Dr. Van Doer's uh, second most effective approach to helping people believe in themselves a social model. Now we come to the first most effective way that people can come to believe in themselves, which is called mastery experience. Anyone ever hear of mastery experience? The most effective way people develop a strong sense of efficacy is through mastery experience. The mastery experience is performing a task and having incremental success. And that incremental success that we have in performing a task strengthens with us, not just a sense of, oh, if you look at us, we can achieve you know, the rest of this task. But each step strengthens our own can do believe in ourselves. Each step that we succeed in masters for us that we are able to develop a sense of internal belief that we can do more. We can do more. So we're gonna, I'm going to share a personal example. Gina, I'm going to share a personal example of the extra experience through the kayak example here with Rachel. Um, so Rachel, who is Gina's sister, uh, is a, uh, she's sitting up front there. Um, the her and uh, I'm sitting in the back because the heavier people have to sit in the back of the guy. Um, Rachel, Gina's sister, is someone who uh, intellectually and educationally is always going to be about 10 or 11 years old. Um, but Rachel is very excited. She likes to be a social person. She likes to do things. She likes to be with people. So Rachel noticed that uh, Gina and I had you know, gotten a kayak and had actually gone down to the uh, shore with mom and dad on vacation. And we took our kayak with us and so we went out kayaking. And as we were coming back up to the pier, Gina and I, the kayak, Rachel saw us and said, I want to go kayak. So uh, Gina and I being the you know, natural supporters and facilitators that we wanted to be, took Rachel Simpson as an action oriented role that she had So we immediately decided to take action on that her goal. And so we offered Rachel the opportunity. Gina said, okay, I'll get out. Here's the paddle. Here's the life uh, preserver. I'll put this on you and you can get in the boat and go kayaking with Scott. Nothing hard, Mr. Rachel Why are you find something? down and she shuffled away a little bit. And she said, no, I don't want to. We said, well, wait a minute, you just said you want to go kayaking. Here's your chance to do it. Right now, we can go. Um, Rachel said, no, I don't want to. She started walking away. What was happening? Fear, yeah. She was doubting. She didn't really have much belief in her ability to succeed with it. So we took an opportunity then to use some deeper skills that we had. We stepped back and we started listening to Rachel. And as we listened to Rachel, we heard that she had a lot of self-doubt. She had lots of fears that she mentioned. Um, some of her fears were of water. She was afraid that she would get dumped out of the kayak and she'd get spilled into the water and she would drown. She also was afraid that she would not be able to um, paddle, that she had never had any practice with using a paddle, um, particularly a paddle that had a paddle on both ends. And she was sitting up front, which means she could not see me. So know how we were going to paddle together. She couldn't see when she was supposed to paddle and when I was paddling. Um, she had very low self-belief. She had no confidence that she could actually succeed. And Rachel likes to succeed. Rachel does not like most of us. Do. We don't want to try something and look dumb or not be able to do it. So we took a look through that mastery experience listening to some of the areas where Rachel had um, self-doubt and a low sense of efficacy. And what we kind of took a look at was how could we use some of the approaches to increase her knowledge, her skills, and through supports and accommodations to have her perhaps successive steps to begin to succeed at the task, the larger task of actually getting in a kayak in the water and then powering around. So one of the things that we started with was the idea of picking the boat and taking, it out, taking the water out of the equation, since water was part of the pier, we decided we put the boat on the shore. 
and on the shore we took uh, that fear of falling in and drowning out of the picture. Then we could work on some skills. We could work on Rachel uh, practicing paddling. We could just do it right there on the shore um, as she practiced paddling and how she would hold it and how she would use it. She could also learn from that I would communicate with her when I was paddling so she didn't have to see me, but I could communicate and say paddle, paddle. Um, she also began to um, have some sense of uh, understanding about the fact that when the kayak was in the water, she really didn't need to fear falling into the water and drowning. There were several things that Rachel had going on. One, we reminded Rachel that she actually knew how to swim, that she had a YMCA. She had taken classes in swimming and had won the flying fish award. Uh, so that flying fish award he that she actually demonstrated um, competency and capacity in the switch. She got the award. I was very excited to hear from that. Um, we also introduced her to the life jacket, what the life jacket would do for her, and how the life jacket would hold her up and support her, and how she would wear it. Um, it kind of worked again with her in terms of likelihood that she might be going to fall in the water anyway. It's very unlikely. So, we then kind of figured out that another key factor for Rachel was going to be to add her a key supporters. But when you're undertaking a difficult task, you want to have all your supports. Um, and some of Rachel's key supporters were her mom and dad. So we uh, invited her mom and dad to come down to the shore the day that we were going to take Rachel out in the kayak. Her mom and dad were going to come down. They were going to watch her, which she got very excited about. So her key supporters were there. Really trust mom and dad, she really believes in you know, the fact that they will be there for her. And then the uh, other thing that we like to do is knowing Rachel, Rachel's very um, photogenic, and she likes to have uh, uh, photogenic evidence of her successes. So Gina asked Rachel to bring her camera down with her, and Gina said to Rachel, I can take a picture of you in the kayak. Next slide. So this is just kind of a, a, a schematic, if you will. Uh, on the bottom is a self-identified goal of kayaking. Right now, um, some of the issues that need to be addressed are on the left-hand side, which is kind of weighing it down towards the left, which is making it unlikely that Rachel believes she can actually get into the kayak and go for it. So she's not willing to try that task that she believes is difficult, more difficult than the capabilities. And as we began to uh, develop the master experiences, um, things can shift over. So learning to paddle, reminding her that she knows how to swim, having a great desire that she already had to you know, kind of do something that Gina and I were already doing. Um, then as we continue to shift over, working as a team, bringing her key supporters in, um, then that began to tip it over to the right where she actually would begin to think about the possibility of literally dipping her toes in the water, getting into the kayak while the kayak was in the water. So that is, they say a picture's worth a thousand words after the process of having those opportunities to build um, Rachel's belief in her own ability to succeed, having successive experiences which she began to master which are overcoming her fears and self-doubts, and we're building her own sense of belief in herself. And that's the most important thing, is not just that she accomplishes a task or two, but she actually developed her increased sense of her own self-efficacy, that she believed in herself. She started to value her own abilities to do things. Um, so that's you know, kind of really the key to it there, is that through um, having these experiences, the person begins to develop their own belief in themselves which makes it more likely for them to try that task and then we go on and try a different task later on. So that is pretty much what Dr. Mandora has to say about uh, helping a person to increase their self-efficacy uh, through those experiences. Us, uh, you your experiences, uh, social modeling, and um, uh, uh, social persuasion. Thank you. Um, so creating environments that promote self-efficacy. Dr. Bandor also talked about, and we've updated his language, but he talked about way back when in the 60s and 70s, what kinds of environments 
promote self-efficacy? How do you des design environments that work with people to promote the belief in themselves? And some of the things he said was, we want uh, to have education, skill building, and rehabilitation available. Those of you that work in rehabilitation probably recognize a lot of these approaches about building knowledge, skills, um, and using accommodations to help the person move forward. If you work in psych rehab, uh, educate the staff. Have the staff be able to be trained in some of these approaches. How to promote um, social persuasion after that three-step process of um, that you talked about the affirmation, evidence buying, and right opportunities. Uh, Action-oriented goals are not always the first response. Sometimes we don't really understand that real well. You know, particularly in a system that says within you know 15 or 30 days you got to have an action-oriented goal down. Action-oriented goals are not necessarily you know, well, sometimes what we see happen is we come up with an action oriented goal and then there's no progress towards that goal. But that was because we had to have that action oriented goal before the person was really ready to take action. Um, so we could put into, you know, some of those things actually about building a person's readiness uh, to be able to pursue a goal. Um, give people participants time to plan and prepare, capitalize on participants' experience and expertise in the group process. Uh, support people to work their edge. Uh, Gia mentioned focus on strengths and give label praise um, and peer support to all be part of a system that really promotes uh, an individual developing uh, the opportunity to uh, build a belief in themselves, which will carry on beyond that. Yes, or that's one goal. And really increase their own performance. All right, this is a workshop, so we're going to end with two interactive pieces. The first one is this. We just want one example of each. So the first way in which we can support a person to believe in their own abilities to succeed was social persuasion, which meant that words matter. Somebody said something and all of a sudden because of that consistent conversation and relationship, you started to believe in yourself. Does anyone have a story, a very brief story, where somebody said something that helped you knock yourself into a place where you could start believing? Ah, sir. Sir, I'm going to carry the microphone up.
there was a time where I was court committed to a teaching hospital. And by the time I was court committed to this teaching hospital, I was fed up with the system. I was fed up with the entire mental health system. So I had the attitude, my own attitude, I needed an adjustment, that if you were part of the system, you leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. However, I was in this teaching hospital, I was in the day room, and I knew that this was going to be the day that the brand new psychology and social work students were going to come onto our unit. Let me give young people credit that they are in this business not to get rich. They are actually in this business to make a difference in the world. But sometimes when you're young and idealistic, you think you can go out and save the world. So I got to tell you, when you're court committed to a locked in unit, the social work and psychology students actually come onto the unit in mass. So they're all kind of coming on their first time in a locked in unit, and they're all assigned to a person. So the young person that was assigned to me came up and I'm sitting in the day room and she sat down beside me and this is what she said. Hey, Gina, we get to work together today, but oh my, you're going to have to turn that frown upside down. What did you think I wanted to do to her? Smack her. I just put my hand in her face and I said, walk away. You make a good point. When people are in a difficult spot, sometimes you can use positive feedback, but sometimes you want to validate perhaps what a person's going through. You want to say, I hear you. I know that sucks, or I know that's unfortunate. Those words can really make a connection because you're not only connecting and trying to support them to move forward, you're connecting to validate how they're feeling as well. But yeah, very important. Let's go to the next one. The next one is social modeling. If you remember, Scott said, when you see a person that you perceive as similar to yourself, achieving a goal that you want to achieve, you say, wait a minute, Gina's not that great. If she can do it, I can do it too. Has anyone ever had an experience where through social modeling, you were able to achieve one of your hopes, dreams, or goals. Ah, you want the mic? No. Oh. I don't have a specific instance, but I used to, I always put that somebody on a pedestal, but I put this in the secondary father images. Kind of a, I mean, I emulate what they do. I kind of did what they did. Okay, so you were seeing somebody that was sort of a mentor that you could yeah. look up to, yeah. and you wanted to have a life that modeled what they were living. Yeah, the way they acted. That, that is a perfect example of social modeling, I gotta tell you, is you just see somebody that you say, wait a minute, if this person can move forward in life and get a job, or this person can have a positive attitude despite all the obstacles, maybe I can learn from them a way to have a positive attitude as well. Yeah, very nice. Let's go with the last one before we play the game. So the last one's mastery experience. Very briefly, mastery experience says baby steps work. Baby steps not only get you closer to the goal you want to achieve, it actually builds your self-confidence along the way. So has anyone been able to reach a goal through baby steps? Thanks, sir. Yeah, just um, I had a bad period of five years ago. I stopped the period of doing it for a while. And little by little, going out to the community again, volunteering, bam, just took care of me again for something that was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a very powerful story. So you stepped out of career, and then you lost your confidence, so you began to volunteer until you could build your confidence to begin to apply for jobs. It made me perfect for what I was doing. I had no idea what was in store. It just prepared me perfectly for that. Uh, awesome, and that is an example of social uh, mastery experience. Okay, we are going to end with the game. I do have prizes. They're not big prizes. How many people here have ever seen the TV?
TV show Jeopardy? Raise your hand. Okay, so you know from Jeopardy, Scott is going to give you the answer, and then you are going to raise your hand. We'll try to get the first person that puts their hand up. You are actually going to give us the question. If it's not in question form, we will prompt you once, and then we're going to move on to the next person. Most noted researcher in the study of self efficacy. Who is Albert Bandura? Woo! Somebody was paying attention. 